Jephthah keeps his promise. In the last story, we learned of Israel's desire for a king and their appointment of Abimelech, Gideon's bastard son. Abimelech ruled over Israel with a cruel fist. He killed many innocent Israelites. When he was seeking to burn down a tower in the middle of a city, a woman dropped a millstone on his head and crushed him. In this story, we will learn about how the Israelites straying once again and giving themselves over to every pleasure and idol they could get their hands on. Soon, they would become oppressed and require deliverance from the Philistines and Ammonites by Jephthah, the judge, inspired by the Book of Judges. Hello, this is Pastor Jack Graham with today's episode of The Bible in a Year. In yesterday's reading, we heard the tragic and violent story of Abimelech, the first king of Israel, who was chosen not by God, but by the people who did not seek God. We saw the devastation caused by this evil king and how God did deliver his people from his hands by one of their own. Today, we'll find Israel walking away, straying, rebelling once again, giving in to all kinds of sin. And as always, this rebellion will have grave, terrible consequences. The people will once more be conquered by a foreign nation, this time the Philistines and the Ammonites. In their hour of need, God will raise up a man named Jephthah to deliver his people from oppression. Jephthah would be filled with God's Spirit, but in his fervor, he would make a promise to God that would cause him great sadness for the rest of his life. Let's listen now to this powerful story. It may be hard to discern why the Israelites continued to stray away from God time and time again. After all, God had delivered them and shown them His faithfulness more times than they could count. However, the gods of the Syrians and Ammonites allowed Israel to seek pleasure, lust, greed, and pride. They did not hold them to a higher standard or demand they treat one another well. The gods were human-made, therefore they might as well have been human worship. So Israel caved to their desires and spiraled into captivity to their own sin and depravity. As the Israelites pursued their own gratification, they let their guard down. Without God by their side fighting for them, they fell into captivity to the Ammonites and the Philistines. For eighteen years they were brutally oppressed. Women were raped and taken as slaves, children grew up with cruel taskmasters, and men were slaughtered and hung on trees. It was a dark age for Israel, and cries could be continually heard from the Jordan River and beyond. Israel, as they had many times before, cried out to God, Save us! We have sinned against you, but please do not forsake us, they prayed. This time God replied to them, Instead of saving them right away and sending a judge as he had done dozens of times before, he responded saying, The Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sidonians, the Amalekites, the Moanites. All these nations I have saved you from. You cried out to me, and I delivered you from their oppressive hands. Yet you have forsaken me every time. Why don't you ask your new gods to save you? Sometimes Israel would forget that God could actually grieve. He loved the people, and they rejected him. The Israelites put away their other gods and served God even in the midst of distress and oppression. This time they worshipped God before He delivered them, not after. Yet of course God would not delay long in saving His people. In the region of Gilead, there was a mighty warrior named Jephthah. Jephthah grew up estranged from his family, for he was a bastard. His father had him with a prostitute, and therefore Jephthah was hated by the rest of his brothers. He toiled in his father's field and protected his family's land with his sword, yet it was never good enough. Jephthah was despised for where he came from, and his brothers eventually cast him out, saying, You are a son of a whore. We will never share our inheritance with the likes of you. And just like that, Jephthah fled from his brothers in the land of Tob. While Jephthah was journeying, he became beloved by other outcasts and forgotten sons. Together they formed a band of worthless fellows, and their reputation grew. They were known for their power, skill, and spirit, and were hired hands for protection. 
Jephthah was rejected by his own family, but found great comfort with the outsiders that followed him. Years had passed, and the Ammonites warred against Israel. The elders of Gilead were distressed and desperate for warriors. They had heard of Jephthah's skill and exploits across the land and sought him out. Come back to us and be our leader, the elders begged. Jephthah scowled at them. How dare they, he thought to himself. First they make me an outcast, and now that they want something from me, they treat me like royalty. Jephthah dismissed them and said, You hated me, and drove me out of my father's house. And now that you're in need, you come begging? The elders continued to beg Jephthah. He sat there in silence. Jephthah had lived as either an outsider or outcast his entire life. His greatest fear was that he would succeed in saving Israel, only to be rejected by them again. He closed his eyes and released a deep sigh. He knew what was right, and he knew he could win against the Ammonites. He opened his eyes and said, I will be your leader in battle, but only if I remain your leader afterwards. The elders agreed, and Jephthah marched with his band of misfit warriors back to his homeland. Jephthah traveled with the armies of Israel behind him. They marched across a valley near the Ammonite camp. It was less than a day before battle, and Jephthah knelt before God in the cool evening. He breathed deeply. His breath could be seen in the winter air. The Spirit of God was with him. He could feel the power of God moving upon the land, preparing victory for him. Jephthah, in a moment of emotion, vowed before God, saying, If you give us victory tomorrow, I will sacrifice whatever comes through my doors first to greet me. Jephthah's oath was not warranted or asked for by God, yet he bound himself to his word and would live to deeply regret it. Jephthah, his band of misfit warriors, and the entirety of Israel's army crossed into Ammonite territory. They stormed the land, gliding through twenty of their cities with swords and arrows. First they took the small towns and stormed the larger cities in great force. Jephthah's unwavering bravery and decisive strategy led them into victory. The Ammonites were subdued under Israel's boot, and God was glorified. Jephthah returned home, glowing from the victory against the Ammonites. He was smiling, anticipating the sacrifice he would make to God. Whatever animal from his land he would see first, he would take and lay it on the altar for God. He closed his eyes once again, breathing in the sweet air of home. He had finally been able to return to his father's land with his family. A new era of peace would reign under him, and Jephthah rejoiced over the next chapter of his life. With his eyes still closed, Jephthah could hear tambourines in the distance. Oh no, Jephthah thought as he opened his eyes. There he saw his beautiful daughter dancing in the sunlight. She had made an entire routine to celebrate her father's victory. Jephthah's heart sank as he watched her twirl with joy. She was his only daughter. Besides her, he had no other child. She was his world and his greatest treasure. Welcome home, father, she said with glee. Then she wrapped her arms around him. Jephthah wept. He tore his clothes in rage. My sweet daughter, I have vowed to the Lord to sacrifice whatever comes through my gates first. The two of them wept together. Jephthah's daughter wiped her tears and changed her posture. She said, You have vowed to God. Do to me whatever is necessary. Only allow me to go to the mountains and weep with my companions over my virginity. For now I will never be married or be a mother. So she was sent away for two months to weep and mourn with her friends. At the end of the two months, Jephthah's daughter came down from the mountain. Her father lamented his own victories in life, for he in his foolishness bound himself to a vow God never asked him to give. His false sense of honor and obedience caused him grief. He and the rest of Israel would remember his vow for the rest of their days. It became a custom in Israel for the women to lament over the daughter of Jephthah every year. Legends of Jephthah's bravery would be drowned out by his foolishness, as many stories often do. Yet the story of God's faithful hand of protection over history continues, and His covenant never wavers. Today's story begins once again with the sinful rebellion of God's people. Despite 
the trustworthiness, the faithfulness of God, all that God had done for them as a people again and again, they chose not to obey his commands. The people of Israel turned to false gods, idols, other gods, which are no gods. This descent into wickedness stirred God's righteous anger because God is a righteous and holy God and justice is served. So he removed his hand of protection and allowed the Philistines and Ammonites to oppress Israel for 18 long years. God's people endured unspeakable horrors men, women, and children alike, until once more they cried out in anguish, God help us. We know we've done wrong. We know that we have sinned. Please do not abandon us. Through the years, they had sinned and sinned and sinned again. But God had taught them that if they turned to him and trusted in him and repented of their sin, he would save them. But this time, it was going to be different. He reminded them of all he had done to save them time and time again. Still, they insisted on idolatry, worshiping other gods. So God told his people to run to those gods for help. God was deeply grieved by the repeated disobedience of his children. Israel did repent, and the people got rid of the other gods. They worshiped God and God alone and submitted to his rule, his sovereignty in their lives. They didn't wait for salvation to praise God. They worshiped him even in the midst of their trials. God heard their worship and resolved to save them once again. He would do this through a man who himself had felt the great pain of rejection by his family. His name was Jephthah. Jephthah was despised by his own, rejected by his brothers because he was the illegitimate son of his father. Jephthah left home despondent and alone until he found company with other outcasts and rejects. These became valiant fighters. And after many years passed, Jephthah's people sought him out for help. They wanted him to lead them in the fight against the Ammonites. Jephthah's response sounded a lot like God's words to his people in Judges 11:7. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now that you are in distress? But they persisted. And he finally agreed, but on the condition that once he defeated their enemies, he would continue to lead them. And they agreed to his terms. So Jephthah gathered Israel's army and went to fight the Ammonites. Before they faced the enemy, Jephthah promised he would sacrifice the first thing that greeted him back home if they were to defeat the Ammonites. God had not required this of Jephthah. It was an impulsive and unsolicited decision, but it was binding. Because of the faithfulness of God, not Jephthah's vow, the Lord gave Israel victory over the Ammonites. Jephthah returned home a hero. But when he was greeted first by his daughter, his joy turned to abject despair. The realization of what his promise would cost him came crashing down on him. There was no escaping it in his mind, and he knew it. And he embraced her and wept bitter tears. He allowed her to go to the mountains with her friends to mourn what she was going to lose, and then he made good on his promise. His story is a reminder that we must always make decisions not based on our own imagination, but on God's revelation. In other words, his promises, not what we think. Jephthah made an unnecessary sacrifice born out of a rash vow that cost him the child, but really saved no one. Many years later, God would make good on his promise born out of love and sacrifice of his son. But that sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ would not be just for Israelites, but to the Jew first and also to the Greek, in other words, to the whole world. These stories are unusual, and sometimes we listen to these stories and wonder why this happened, what happened. But remember, this entire message of the Bible is pointing to the greatest sacrifice of all the redemption of salvation through God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Always see the Savior in the Scriptures. Dear God, thank you for today's reading, which reminds us to be thoughtful and careful with our commitments. And thank you, Lord, that you counted the cost and sent Jesus, your Son, to die in our place, that though the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus our Lord. And we do pray for those who are seeking you, who want to know you and have a personal relationship with you through your son. And we ask for their salvation in Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for listening to today's Bible in a Year podcast. I'm Pastor Jack Graham from Dallas, Texas. Download the Pray.com app and make prayer a priority in your life. If you enjoyed this podcast, share it with someone you love. By sharing this podcast, you can make a difference in someone's life. If you want to know more about the Lord, how to know Him, how to serve Him, and be His disciple, then let me encourage you to visit my website, which is jackgraham.org. We would love to assist you in any way possible as you grow in your journey of faith. Again, that's jackgraham.org. God bless you.